Does it make sense to you that if the judgment determines whether a person is saved or lost, so I'm talking eternally now, if these prophecies pinpoint the judgment, the time period that a person's destiny is sealed forever, wouldn't that make it reasonable to conclude that these prophecies are probably the most important prophecies for us to understand so that we can know the time frame that God has set for judgment, for our judgment? Is that reasonable? Okay, let's, uh, let's ask for some guidance and enlightenment as we are going to study here. Father in heaven, we thank you for this evening and morning for some. We ask that you be with us. Father, we pray that our worship here, our fellowship, our study will be acceptable to you. And Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit lead us and guide us into all truth and help us to understand things that are at times difficult to understand. Father, we, we need to know what your word says and we need to know the meaning of it. We pray that you watch over us, speak to our hearts. We pray in Yeshua's name, amen. <clears throat> we were studying the other day with another group and we were, I sort of put this PowerPoint together kind of a review and I was bringing out some different points trying to make emphasis in different areas uh, a lot of us come from different backgrounds so so uh, sometimes it's you know a one-on-one -on -one study you can directly um, directly go after what a person may have been taught and uh, and then you can go at it that way. When you have a group of people, it's a little bit different. It's interesting that Paul says something in the New Testament. I forget, I think it might be in the book of Acts, where he said he went up to those of reputation. He went to them privately. Now, that's an interesting. Has anyone, has anyone heard that statement? that Paul went up to those of reputation, he went to them privately to share the gospel with them. And when I first saw that, I thought, what is going on Galatians here? Galatians 2.2. 2. Galatians 2.2. 2. Okay. So what is going on here? Well, the thing is, when, when you're in a group, when you're sharing something new, and you're in a group that everyone believes a certain way, um, there's there's quite a bit of peer pressure and for an odd man to come in and try and change the way a room thinks or uh, several people think it's nearly impossible because number one no one likes to be wrong in what they believe they like to believe what they've accepted is the truth and nothing but the truth um, but obviously we're starting to figure out that that's not necessarily true just because I believe something. Uh, that doesn't mean it's true. It, it may have nothing to do what, with the truth. The truth will stand by itself and it'll be truth even if I don't believe it. So that's something that we have to come to grips with is the truth will stand on its own and it doesn't need me to stand with it. In a lot of cases, uh, we don't stand with the truth. Obviously, we need to have the truth as we move forward. So that's obviously what we're looking for. But my point being is that Paul was very wise when he shared with his peers. He realized that if he was going to make inroads into their minds, he was going to have to speak to them as individuals all by themselves. And... Um, 
And of course, that's not what we're doing here. We have people that tune into the internet and watch our stuff. And we get all kinds of different comments. Uh, most, the most comments that we have are good. Um, but we have some comments that they think that what we're teaching is ridiculous. And the main reason that they think it's ridiculous is because it's not what they were taught and not what they believe. And so uh, that's what I find quite interesting. So as a group here, we all kind of uh, are looking at these prophecies the same. So, so it's, it's going to be a lot easier in, in a group setting like this. But there will be people out there that are going to listen to this and they're going to say, oh, no, this is crazy. But I'm, I'm going to try and make some points a little differently tonight uh, in this presentation that some of you may have heard before. But I'm going to try and really emphasize one thing. And uh, I don't want anybody to be offended by this, but I'm going to emphasize the mistakes that have been made in, with the um, theologians in the past that have brought many of us uh, to where the things that we believe. One of the comments I got back the other day from this group I was with was, we are so wrapped up in the historical application of these prophecies, we're having a hard time moving forward to looking at them differently. Can anyone relate to that? No? Yes. Yes. Okay. And that's, that, is, that is so natural. And do you, know, do you know that that is God's safety net that he's built right into our minds? And, and let me explain. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, their first contact was God. And so when God was sharing the truth with them, that should have been their safety net when Satan came along with another story. So what happens when somebody tells us something and they tell us as if it's truth and all truth, when we accept that as being all truth, it's very hard for us to change our position once we've accepted something as truth. And so when I came into a certain church, I was told some of these prophetic interpretations. And uh, as I studied deeper into these uh, interpretations, I was noticing in Scripture that it doesn't actually say what I was told it said. It was a lot like what it said, but it wasn't quite what it said. In fact, it said something completely different. And we're going to look at those things. I want to expose those things because unless a person sees the, the problems with the prophecies, it's hard to move forward. And, and I, know, uh, I know the group that I'm speaking with here tonight, they've got everything figured out 100%. So I'm not really talking to you guys, but the thing is, when you're talking to other people that are, have an understanding that's different than this, understanding that you need to show them the pitfalls where their interpretation does not actually work. Let me, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about, kind of a parallel, if you will. If you go to the bank and you withdraw money from the bank and because you want to buy something and you go and buy something and then uh, you get what you needed and, and that was all very great. And then next time you got paid, you went to the bank and you deposited uh, some more money and then you went back to the bank or you wrote a check. At some point, if you do not deposit money into the bank, you're going to run short in your funds. And you may get to the place, if you keep doing that, you may get to the place where you're bankrupt. And you see, this is really where people are today. They are bankrupt. 
in their understanding of Scripture because they can't, number one, they can't prove it, and they're not teaching what the Bible teaches, although they think they are teaching what the Bible teaches. And so this is what we don't want to be as bankrupt. And when we get to Revelation chapter 3, we see the bankrupt church, and the bank tr bankrupt church thinks they have lots of money in the bank, which are truths, actually, because the value of what they have, what they think they have, is truth. But Yeshua says that they don't have anything. They are in need of everything. And so he bids them to buy Isav, which makes you see. That's what helps you to see. So we're not talking about money here. We're talking about truth. Yeshua is talking about truth. And he wants them to have Isav so they can see. And the problem is, is people, for whatever reason, some people just don't want to see the truth. And in fact, they fight against the truth and brace themselves against it when the Holy Spirit is trying to get through to them. They brace themselves against the truth, and that's, that's probably the most dangerous position. In fact, according to Yeshua, uh, not heeding the voice of the Holy Spirit is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, because there's nothing else God can do for a person if they're saying no to the Holy Spirit. And that's, we're going to be looking at that in our study with the science of salvation because blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is the unpardonable sin. And it's not that it's a bad sin that can't be pardoned. It's just that when you reject God's most powerful force in the universe, which is the Spirit of God, that's his way of communicating with us, if we say no to that power, there's nothing more that God can do. So it's not, it's not a sin that we intend to uh, make. In fact, most people will reject the Holy Spirit and do reject the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's work is to lead us and guide us into all truth and show us things to come. So the work of the Spirit is to show us things that are going to happen in the future. That's prophecy. And all truth. So if we're rejecting truth that we're being shared, or we're sharing, if people are rejecting what we're sharing, and it's truth, and we're doing it through the work of the Holy Spirit, then they are actually blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And that's something that people really don't think carefully through. Um, if somebody says they have truth, we really need to check it out at least to the degree where we can say, no, it's not true. But just to turn your head because it's not something that I was taught or it's not something I believe is not going to cut it, is not going to cut it in the final determination of the direction of our lives. And so we have to super, uh, really super be careful about allowing the Holy Spirit to get through to us. When we were in... Um, when I was teaching at the college, one of the courses that I went on to teach us how to teach, um, one of the first things they showed us was that when you're in front of your students, the hardest thing to do is to get them to change their minds on something that they were taught that isn't correct. That, that is the, the hardest thing for a teacher to do is to actually change the mind once a person has accepted something as a fact. And uh, I found that in, in gospel. I found that in the college as well when I was teaching electrical. When somebody believed a certain theory of electrical, it was very hard to get them to look at it from another direction. And that's just, that's just part of teaching. That's the way it is across all different... Um, disciplines of teaching and it can't be can't be more true than the bible because we depend on those that teach us to be teaching all truth because our salvation our eternal salvation could be based on what we believe and i i would propose it is based on what we believe and so it's ultimately the most important uh search 
that we have in our whole lives is to find out what is truth. When Pilate was standing in front of Yeshua, he who was the truth, and he asked the question, what is truth? He didn't stick around. It says that he left the room. Right after he asked Yeshua the question, what is truth? He left. And um, wow, we certainly don't want to do that. We have the spirit of Yeshua teaching us, uh, not in person, we're not standing in front of him, but in a sense, he is with us uh, at all times, leading us and guiding us into all truth. So we don't want to do that. So let's, let's look at these prophecies and, and let's have questions. Um, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to questions as we go. Um, let's try and just nail these things right down. Now, Daniel 7 and Daniel 8 and 11, Revelation 12, Revelation 13, 14, and 17 are all prophecies that I think can be linked together very easily. They're probably the easiest prophecies to link together. 7, 8, and 11 of Daniel are all the same prophecy. They're all speaking of the same events. And we know Revelation 12, 13, 14, and 17 are all the same as well. So if you can link any one of those chapters, you've got the whole thing linked together without question. So that's, that's really what we're going to be um, looking at here tonight. So, so if you have any questions as we go, let's, let's have them. Daniel's and John's vision of the four beasts. So in Daniel 7, we have four beasts, which are four kingdoms. And then we get to, to Daniel chapter 8, and we have four horns, which are told, we're told are four kingdoms. And both of those prophecies have a little horn. So both of those prophecies are symbolic. So they're similar in nature in that they're symbolic, but they also have the interpretation. So we know what the beasts represent. It tells us those are kingdoms. We know what the little horn represents. We know what the horns represent in Daniel 8. They're kingdoms, and we have a little horn. So there, there's no question these are directly linked, those two prophecies. The challenge that uh, some have is chapter 11 of Daniel. Daniel 11 is not symbolic in nature. It's strictly literal. And so we don't have the benefit of having some kind of animal in Daniel chapter 11. It's straight uh, literal. But when we take the literal parts of Daniel chapter 11 and connect them with the interpretation of Daniel 7 and the interpretation of Daniel 8, we can see definitely that we have a match. That's how we do it. We, don't have, we can't carry the symbols forward in Daniel 11 but we can carry the interpretations of 7 and 8 into Daniel 11 because the interpretations of Daniel 7, 8, and 11 are all literal. No question about that. So that's how we make the match there. When we get to Revelation 12, we have a symbol in a great red dragon. And in 13, we have another symbol in a beast that comes up out of the sea and it has it has parts of Daniel 7 and 8 and 11 once we start examining we can see clearly that these are talking about the same events as well so that's that's how we're going to kind of piecemeal this this together here so what is the the main point of these chapters. And if I asked the question, we'd get all kinds of ideas here, which they're probably all right ideas. But if I was to, if I was to put it on a stove and, and simmer it down to the very minimum, get rid of all the water and, all the, and let it all evaporate, and I would be left with one main fact, is all these visions are for a specific time period. One is the time of the end. We're told that without any question. They're at the time of the end. But the other thing that is 
probably the most important part of that time of the end. This is what God wants us to understand. It's the judgment. So doesn't it make sense to you? It makes sense to me. So I'm asking you, does it make sense to you that if the judgment determines whether a person is saved or lost, so I'm talking eternally now, if these prophecies pinpoint the judgment, the time period that a person's destiny is sealed forever, wouldn't that make it reasonable to conclude that these prophecies are probably the most important prophecies for us to understand so that we can know the time frame that God has set for judgment, for our judgment? Is that reasonable? Okay, Judy says I'm getting people nodding their head. I hope it's up and down. Now, let's, let's go one step further on this. I'm going to push this envelope, get some more stuff in it. I would say that these prophecies that end in the second coming of Yeshua, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is the judgment. If my judgment is set prior to Yeshua returning, Yeshua's returning may be completely irrelevant if I haven't got the judgment right. Are you with me? So people are so focused on the second coming and the millennium that they miss the judgment that precedes that event. And if we go into the judgment unbeknownst to us, if we don't know the time frame of the judgment, then I would propose we're not going to be ready for the judgment. And therefore, we will not be ready for Yeshua when he returns. Now, I don't know if you guys have thought on those terms. But I believe the reason why God really pulls out the judgment in these prophecies is so that we know exactly when the judgment begins. He's got the beasts or the kingdoms, all represented on stage, doing their thing when judgment begins. And the reason why he's shown us the events in the prophecy is so that we can know when judgment begins. And when we get to book of Revelation in chapter 14, it says that there's three angels flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those of every kindred, tongue, and nation. And the, and the very first thing they're saying is the hour of his judgment has come. That's the central theme in all of these prophecies is judgment. It's not necessarily second coming. It's the judgment. Because we gotta be we gotta come out of the judgment on the right side if Yeshua's coming is gonna benefit us. So that's what we're we're gonna focus in on these prophecies on the judgment. If we get the judgment right, the second coming is just gonna flow right into itself. We're not gonna have to worry about the second coming at all. A lot of people worry about the second coming. What side are they going to be on? If we get the judgment right, it's going to be uh, good for us all the way. So that's, that's really what we're going to be focusing on here is the judgment. So it's the judgment that is the most important thing. It's really the central theme as we're going to go through Daniel 7. It's, it's really the, the pillar of this whole thing. And uh, everything that happens uh, after the judgment, it's all bonus. Not a lot of detail on what happens after the judgment. The, the judgment is going to change everything for us. 
So let's, um, if you want to turn with me in your Bibles to make sure I've got the verses right, that's fine. Otherwise, we're going to have them up on the screen and uh, we'll go through it verse by verse. Uh, and we're going to see exactly what it says and we're going to see exactly what it doesn't say. Daniel chapter 7. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head while on his bed. Then he wrote down the dream, telling every detail. Is that what it says? No, that's not what it says. Telling the main facts. So if you had a dream and... Uh, you just told the main facts, you're obviously missing some of the details, right? Well, the only way we can get the rest of the details are reading other prophecies, grabbing other prophecies, because we're going to find, when we get to Daniel 8 and Daniel 11, different details are recorded in those prophecies. And that's how we get the rest of the story. So in Daniel chapter 7, we're already told. We've only got the main facts here. We don't have all the details. So for us to make some kind of huge theological discovery in Daniel chapter 7 and, and create a whole doctrine on, on Daniel chapter 7 and details of the prophecy, we can't do that. We've got to be very careful because we've only got the main facts. But we can deal with the main facts, especially as we see those main facts carried forward into other prophecies. And that's how we can link the other prophecies, because we can see the main facts in the other prophecies. But we have more details in those other prophecies, and that's how we fill in the gaps. So we can't forget that. All prophecy is, is dealt like this. You can go through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, read a prophecy here, read a prophecy there. You're going to find that there's just some facts, not all. We've got to keep uh, building this house in order to see the whole thing. We can't just take one prophecy and run with it. Yeah, I had a question. You were saying that, you know, the judgment precedes like the second coming. So is that, so when we understand the feast, the judgment comes at atonement, and then the second coming comes at Passover, right? So if we get the feast in the right order, will we have the, the judgment and the second coming in the right order? Yes. And you, you jumped into a little bit of the typology, the meaning of the festivals, which are prophecy as well. So we can pull in the prophecies, and that's, we can fill, pull in the prophecies of the festivals into the prophecies of the time of the end. And we should be able to blend them. So the only way we can do that uh, correctly is if we understand the typology of the feast. And I propose, and I'm just going to go right out there and say this, that the majority, wow, that's quite a statement. The majority is misunderstanding the typology of the feast. Now that should not surprise us. It should not surprise us because history is repeating itself perfectly because we haven't learned the lessons of the past. So it was like, like that in the time of Yeshua uh, in his church. Those that should have known better, uh, they missed him. He was the Passover lamb. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share some things I've been doing some, um, some homework with some people, homework on some people, some teachers in the Messianic world. I'm not even going to talk really about those are, that are in Sunday keeping churches. And if you're in a Sunday keeping church uh, out there watching this, I'm going to challenge you uh, that you really need to look at the New Testament differently. It's not a new religion in the New Testament. It's a carry forward of the old ways. Yeshua wasn't bringing in a new religion. He wasn't changing the laws that he actually gave Moses on Sinai. And so um, 
we really need to take ourselves out of looking at the New Testament as if it's a new religion for a new group of people called Gentiles. And there's now two religions, two great religions. There's Judaism, which they're saved through their sacrificial system, etc. And then there's Christianity that are saved by grace and there's no more law. That could not be farther from the truth. Every person that is ever going to be saved, it's going to be through the blood of Yeshua. And uh, he died because of my sin. Sin is transgression of the law. But because Yeshua died for my sin, for my transgression of the law, doesn't give me license to continue breaking the law. It's supposed to curtail me or redirect me into an area where I'm not breaking the law anymore. Yeah, that's God's plan, is so that I'm not a lawbreaker anymore. Him dying and giving me grace that's sufficient for me is not a license to continue breaking his law. And I start with the Ten Commandments and then the Torah. Yes, the Torah is added into that for those of you that seem to think the Torah is done away with. Uh, Yeshua didn't teach that. Uh, Chapter 5 of Matthew is very clear. He said, think not that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. He was saying, I didn't come to change this stuff. He said, I came to fulfill it. Oh, so does that mean that because he fulfilled the law, I don't have to? No, no, I would say it doesn't because he was baptized. Not because he had broke the law and he had to rise to new, new life. He had new life at conception through the Holy Spirit. When we have new life at our birth of the Holy Spirit taking control of our lives, the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us to keep his law. That's what Ezekiel 26, um, or 36, 26, and 27, it says that he puts a new spirit within us to cause us to walk in his statutes and judgments and do them. So if anyone is led by the Holy Spirit, it's the same Holy Spirit that was in the Old Testament, that is in the New Testament that was poured out. It's for the purpose of us keeping God's law so that Yeshua's blood is covering our sins. And he wants us to walk in his ways. So I kind of digress there, but um, we have a lot of people uh, that watch our presentations. I think they maybe just stumble on them somehow uh, that are Sunday keepers. And, um, and so I just wanted to address that because we really need, to, uh, really need to look at this. There's not going to be two groups of uh, Christians or there's not going to be Jews and Christians. We're all brought under the same household of faith. That's what Yeshua did. Ephesians chapter 2 teaches that very clearly. So this little rant I just had about the law, we're going to see this comes up in Daniel chapter 7. So this, there's no question what I'm saying uh, pertains to this chapter about the changing of laws and the times as well. So we're going to get there as we move forward in chapter 2 of Daniel, or chapter 7 of Daniel. So verse 2, it says, Daniel spoke, saying, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. So as we go through this, we want to really unpack this. We want to, we want to really get to the bottom of what he's saying right here. So we're going to pick this apart as we go. So he said, I saw in my vision by night. There's my first point. What is this? Somebody just, just, just respond. We call it a dream in verse 1. Dream. Okay. So in verse 1, it says he had a dream. He was in his bed and he had a dream. And then here it says, in my vision. So in my dream, he's going to tell us this, the main facts. And he said, uh, behold, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. So my first point is, is this Daniel's second vision or it is is it his first vision first nice daniel chapter 2 was nebuchadnezzar's vision and daniel prayed with his friends 
and he was given understanding to a vision that Nebuchadnezzar had. This is a really, really important point, believe it or not. This is an extremely important point. This is Daniel's first vision, okay? We're going to come back to that later on. So it says here, the four winds of heaven were stirring up the great sea. So stirring up, the four winds were stirring up the great sea. What is that talking about? We can go to Revelation chapter 7, and we see four angels holding the four winds of heaven so that they should not blow on the earth. Well, when we understand, when we read in Revelation what these four winds are, it's strife, it's war, it's bloodshed, it's famine, it's pestilence, it's earthquakes, it's natural disasters, all thrown into the time of the end. And that's what makes, uh, makes so much confusion in the world because people are wondering what's going on. This is going to be a, our best opportunity that we're ever going to have to witness because people are going to be going crazy during this time. In fact, I'm finding even today, uh, people are going crazy today because they're wondering what's happening in the world. Everyone seems to be losing it. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to get into that. We all know what's going on in the world today. It's just people, we're seeing two sides develop. There's a side that wants to have freedom, total freedom, to be able to do whatever they want. Uh, and there's a side that says, hey, you can't do that. You can't do those things that you're saying that you should have freedom to do because the end result is not going to be good. Uh, and they're saying things like Sodom and Gomorrah. You know, it would, you know, if we can go by the examples in the Bible when people started doing those things, it never ended well. And so there's a group that is saying to the other side, this, like, you guys can't do this. We don't want to do that. We don't want you to do that. We don't want our nations to do that. And so we're seeing two sides develop. One is full on evil. And the other side, they're closer to the all truth side. Although, as I've said before, the process of the Reformation is still ongoing. And I want to emphasize that a little bit. I talk to a lot of people in the Messianic world that are very proud of themselves because they have reached a certain, uh, as it were, climax to their experience because now they keep the feasts and they keep the Sabbath and they keep the Torah and they only eat certain things and, and, and all of this stuff. And so somehow they think that they're better than anyone else and they start... Uh, you know, almost slandering people that don't do the things that they do. And how could they ever, you know, not keep the Sabbath and, and eat all those things and still eat pork? And, you know, they're just rejecting truth. I propose that most people on this planet have not heard a good um, expose of truth. That's our job. We need to win them to the truth because they haven't heard it. In fact, those same people that are so proud of themselves for walking in all the truth, so they think all the truth, is uh, they think they've arrived, but it was only a few years back when they were doing what those people that they're criticizing doing. They're not allowing people to work through uh, the discovery of truth. And they're basically saying, you know, uh, Yeshua could come back anytime. I'm ready. Those guys are all going the wrong direction anyways. We don't have a right to say that. We actually don't have a right to say. I would propose that most people that are going to be saved are still out there in the world. They're still coming to grips with what the truth is. And this right-wing movement, this conservative movement that we see all over the world now. We've got a conservative movement that are called fascists in Germany. I want to do some more homework on, on those guys. Um, but they're taking a lot of heat in the, in the regular news, which is natural. But all over the world, we're seeing a rise 
in conservative uh, ism and people are just not wanting to go to this new way of freedom where you can do whatever you want you can one day be a female the next day be a male and and then you're somewhere in between you're floating around somewhere uh, that's just not not going to work and, and a lot of people are raising up and saying no no we're not into this any longer and we're getting a change and there is a rise in the conservative movement all over the world it's not just in the United States it's not just in Canada uh, there's a rise and we're going to see some political changes the wind is going to be changing in politics so this questionnaire is the the four winds are stirring uh, they're not let loose yet but they're stirring we can see it building in the world we can see the possibility of civil unrest possible civil war I, I'm I would not uh, say at this point that we're not going to see civil war I think we should be ready for that if it happened God forbid but we are going to see strange things before this is all over uh, Luke it talks about civil unrest uh, commotions that's civil unrest and uh, we're going to see it we could see it as near as the fall I would say January for sure uh, we're going to see some strange things in January okay the four winds stirring uh, stirring up the great sea what is the great sea the great sea of people we see that in Revelation chapter uh, 17 talks about the sea a woman sitting on a scarlet colored beast and the waters that are there are the peoples nations languages and tongues that's Revelation chapter 17 we can see that so when we compare uh, the symbols in both of these books we can start making sense of them so the great sea is all the people of the world so we can expect this isn't going to just be one nation we're seeing this unrest this building uh, this stirring up is a worldwide thing it's not just in the Middle East it's not just in Africa it's not in China it's not just in Russia it's a worldwide event that's going on here and this we can see clearly um, I mean the United States is facing possible war in Taiwan they're they're involved in the war in Ukraine uh, they're involved in the Middle East and um, it's just those are those are three areas that are on fire right now and uh, it's not good they cannot handle a three-front war not with those nations it's not possible so uh, we can see this happening right now so goes on here Revelate or Daniel chapter 7 3 and 4 and four great beasts came up from the sea each different from the other the first was like a lion and it had eagles wings I watched till the wings were plucked off and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on two feet like a man and a man's heart was given to it now this is very interesting um, we see here that it's named we have a lion with eagle's wings so we have two great beasts that somehow are linked together and then they're separated and it doesn't the the eagle doesn't carry forward in the prophecy it's ripped off and it seems like it's pretty much discarded and the lion is what moves forward from this point so here again we only have we only have the main facts we don't have the details of why the lion was ripped off uh, it'd be nice to have that but we don't have that what happened to the lion we don't know why the the wings were uh, were ripped off but wings lift things into the air they're what allows something to fly uh, we can see that in an airplane we can see that in a bird uh, it's just the way it works so what whatever was lifting up the lion whatever was supporting the lion lifting it if you will uh, was ripped off and the lion had to stand on its own two feet 
and a man's heart was given to it. When was the man's heart given to it? After it was, uh, after the wings were plucked off, or before? After. After. Okay. So we're looking at. We've only got the main details. Or sorry, we've only got the main facts. But we need to make use of these main facts and see exactly what it says. We need to do that. So if a man's heart was given to this lion, can somebody tell me what is significant about a man's heart? It's not good. Desperately wicked. <laughs> nice. Thank you. It's desperately wicked above all things. That's what a man's heart is. Okay, so humor me for a moment, if you will. If the desperately wicked thing that's wicked above all things on the earth, when it's given to evil, what was it like before when it had the eagle with it? Now I'm looking at, I'm just looking at some ideas here. What was it like before the eagle's wings were ripped off, before it was given this deceitful and wicked heart? What? By default. Loving. Caring. It was honest and true. Righteous? Yeah. Honest oh. and true. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And we're just trying to reason this through. I'm not trying to put things in concrete here. I'm just trying to reason out something here. So is it possible that when the eagle and the lion are flying together before the eagle has been ripped off, it's actually a good cause, a righteous cause. But when the, when the eagle is ripped off, it all falls apart because the eagle is the righteous part of the beast. It is the motivating, for, the motivating force behind the goodness of this beast. Yeah. Hey, Tom, is that a question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I just thought about this weeks ago when you were talking about it. So when you say the lion, you know, which is the UK, would that mean the Commonwealth countries connected to it well, like Australia, Canada, South Africa? Is that part of the lion in this consideration? Or does uh, what happens to us, like, are we disconnected from the U.S. as well and all that? So it's kind of right. something I thought of. I would, I would say that if we're, and, and we are entertaining to, to try and put some, some context, some end time context on this, um, the reasonable conclusion would be, I think, and we're going to try and nail this down, I think it's once a person looks at it from this angle, I think it becomes, in my mind, obvious, but obvious not to some people because they don't accept it. But it looks like the lion could very well be the UK, Great Britain, and the eagle being the United States. So if the eagle and the United or the eagle and the lion are together, and that represents the United States and Great Britain as the most powerful nations of a block of nations, I would say that Canada, Australia, and New Zealand would be all part of this. Yeah. But anyways, yeah, I think, I, I do believe because the United States, Great Britain, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand will all be tied into this. And there's going to be, I believe, this is, is representing when the eagle and the lion are together at, at this time before the wings are ripped off, is they are working for... Uh, a righteous cause. It's a conservative movement. I believe that's what we're dealing with here, the conservative movement. And uh, they will get control. However, uh, something's going to happen to rip the, the lion's wings off. 
And we don't find that out until we get to chapter 8. So, um, so we have to wait to chapter 8 to get that detail. And uh, so that's, that's what it looks like. Because we're seeing a conservative movement. Uh, the greatest conservative movement is probably pushing hard in the United States. But we're seeing it in Europe now. I'm proposing that this man's heart, it didn't ha this beast did not have it. It had, it had good motives, good causes that it was trying to push forward, and that God was somehow in the mix. Now, that doesn't mean that they're going to be Sabbath keepers. and It could just mean that it's going to be a situation kind of like Nebuchadnezzar, that God was able to use Nebuchadnezzar, although he wasn't a Sabbath keeper. He recognized the God of Daniel and made laws uh, regarding uh, worship uh, before it went all sideways, of course, with uh, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson, who went totally against what Nebuchadnezzar did, and then also uh, with uh, Cyrus, who uh, made favor with the God of Daniel. So this is what we're looking at. We're going to see history kind of repeat itself. There will be a great push in the conservative movement. And, and why do I say that? Because God says in, Daniel, or in uh, Acts chapter 2 that he's going to pour out his spirit on just his body. Is that what it says in Acts chapter 2? He's going to pour out his spirit on just his body? My Bible no. says on all flesh. That means there's going to be a great awakening to move forward a according to his word. And this is what this movement will be like. It'll be a push to keep to his word. So, so this is what they want. This is what the conservative movement wants. And they're not shy in saying that they want to keep to the Judeo-Christian values. And it may be a surprise to many that are possibly listening. Is Putin actually talks that language. He says that the West has thrown out their Judeo-Christian values, and that's why they're in such a mess. Well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Um, but that's what he's saying. He's allied himself with the, the Eastern Orthodox Church. Now, that doesn't mean that he's given himself over to the ways of Yeshua, but he's, he's acting as if he sees value in those values, and it may be just for the simple reason he's allied himself to the church, because if, you can, if you're a government and you can control the church, then you can control the conscience of the people that go to those churches. You see, this is really where it's all going. It's in order to control the conscience of people, you've got to control what's taught in the churches, and the governments have to have control of the churches. So, with what we have going on in the governments now, is the governments are not controlling the churches as in the teachings of the church, because they have moved away from the teachings of the church. They've gone full-on apostasy. So there has to be a coming back to the teachings of the Bible. So that's when God pours out his spirit on all flesh. And I believe we're seeing that right now in the world. God is pouring out his spirit on all flesh. The righteous or God's church is waking up and seeing the evil and they're starting to commit themselves to follow the truth. And that's where we need to really rise to the occasion and help people come to a fully, fuller knowledge of the truth. So let's move on, shall we? In Daniel chapter 7 verse 5, suddenly another beast, a second like a bear. It was raised up on one side, and it had three ribs of the lion in its mouth, between its teeth. And they said, thus to it, arise, devour much flesh. Is that what your Bible says? No? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It doesn't say that those are the three ribs of the lion. It doesn't even hint that they're the three ribs on the lion. 
we left the lion standing up like a man, and now we have a bear with three ribs in its mouth, and it says, arise and devour much flesh. It doesn't say, arise and devour the lion. There's really no indication here that the lion goes anywhere from the scene. It's still there. I would propose the lion is still there and alive and well uh, during the time of the bear. In fact, they are on the stage operating at the same time. This is what the prophecy actually says, and we're going to get there. So just because it rises and devours much flesh doesn't mean that it eats the lion. If it ate the lion, it should say that it ate the lion. But it doesn't. It doesn't take the lion's position. So uh, three ribs uh, definitely represents something. Possibility, three kingdoms maybe that it devours. Uh, we, don't, we don't know. We don't have enough information there. But it's an angry bear, for sure. After this, I looked, and there was another, like a leopard, which had on its back four wings of a bird. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. Follow me closely. I'm going to go backwards. Does this say that dominion was given to the bear? From the lion? So the kingdom that the lion had, it had dominion over its kingdom. But it doesn't say that the bear was given dominion over its kingdom. Nor does it say that the bear had some kind of dominion. But we know that the bear is a kingdom as we move forward. But this does not say it had dominion from the lion. It took the lion's dominion. The reason why I bring that up is because these beasts don't follow each other in chronological order in that they replace one another. So that's why the bear, it says, is not given dominion. Because it isn't given dominion. Not in the sense that the leopard is given dominion. Let's look at the leopard. It says it has dominion now. And dominion was given to it. I propose that the leopard is going to have dominion over the world. It will be the strongest power in the world when the eagle's wings are plucked off the lion. So, if that's true, then the eagle had the dominion that is taken over by the, by the leopard. So the leopard takes dominion from the eagle when the eagle is taken out. So now let's put some uh, modern day uh, application here. What power in the world would replace the United States if the United States went down as the number one superpower in the world? The European Union? China. China. <laughs> China. China. Yeah, China. Absolutely. China, there's no way that Europe or Russia um, or England would go to war against China. They just wouldn't do it. They would surrender before they did that. All of them would surrender. Russia has a working agreement with China, and they know they have to have a working agreement with China because... China could take them out, uh, and so they have a working agreement with China. Uh, the Middle East now has a working agreement with China. China has a working agreement with a lot of different countries now because of its power. And uh, they haven't fully exercised it, but they're going to. And this, this tells us the main facts here. So Daniel 7 has a leopard with four wings of a bird and four heads. So the four heads, it doesn't tell us what they are, but we know from other places, the heads represent kingdoms. So when China is given dominion over the world, it's going to take whatever kingdoms that it wants. 
Now, if you'll do some searching on the internet, you're going to find that the Asian nations, Japan, Philippines, Taiwan, Indonesia, um, what are some other nations over there? Um, Vietnam, all those nations that rely on the United States, not all of them, but a lot of those nations, the Philippines, Taiwan, and Japan, all rely on the, the United States for their security. However, they are getting very worried because the United States is showing weakness in the world. I would propose that as soon as the United States goes down, loses its number one capability in the world, China is going to make its move on the entire Asian landmass, and they will take control of it, uh, without question. I mean, we already know they're pushing in the direction of the Philippines and also Taiwan. That's, that's in the news on a daily basis. And also Japan is getting very concerned. In fact, they're, they're upping their military spending because of this uh, drastically in this uh, current budget I was just reading about the other day. They are very, very concerned about China and the rise of China. So the prophecy says that this third beast gets dominion. Now that doesn't mean that these other nations are still not going to be nations. They're still going to be nations. But China will have dominion over the world. They will be the number one nation in the world when the eagle goes down. Let's get to the fourth beast now. Daniel chapter 7, verse 7. After this, I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring and breaking in pieces and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were before it. And I put this word in here because we need to see this word. Uh, in the Hebrew, it's actually not Hebrew, um, it's ancient Chaldean, and it's used elsewhere in, in the books that are Chaldean. That would be uh, the book of um, Esther, the um, book of Ezra, and there's one more. Uh, um, what's the other one? Yeah, there's one more. I want to name it because it's quite quite important that we we know that. Ezra, Nehemiah. So those three books. Those three books, uh, it's my understanding, they were written in uh, ancient Chaldean. And so we need to use that, uh, that word. So in the Hebrew... It comes from this ancient Chaldean word, but when we look at that ancient Chaldean word, it actually means before it, as in in its presence. So, so that's kind of interesting. So here it says, we, we read this, it says, it was different from all the beasts that were before it. So often when we read the word before, we think of before in time but it's before in its presence. So I'm standing before the king. This is how it's used in these other books, in Ezra, and Nehemiah, and Esther. It would say that Esther was before the king, or Nehemiah was before the king. It's not in time, it's in place. So it's in, he's standing before. So what this is actually saying, because this is ancient Chaldean, same language, these, these beasts, this fourth beast, is before it in its presence. So what it's saying here at the fourth beast, it's saying all these guys are present on the stage at one time. They're all operating at one time on the stage. And we find that when we go back actually to the word and look at the meaning of the word and see where it's used elsewhere. So in our historical application, we've gone through this prophecy and we've, we've said that Babylon uh, was, the, was the lion, Medo-Persia was the bear, Greece was the leopard, 
and Rome, ancient, ancient Rome was the, the horn that came out of this, but it was the divisions of the ten kingdoms of Europe. When we start analyzing what the prophecy actually says, it looks like a good fit, but here's the deal. This is the interesting part. If you believe error and you've never seen truth, but it's a good, it's a good take on what the prophecy says, but it's error, you don't have anything to weigh that error with. But when you see the truth in the prophecy, now you can actually determine what you've been taught, whether it's truth or not. So this is why we're going through this prophecy very carefully and looking at each of the words and seeing if what we've been taught is actually what it says. And I would propose this is the first clear uh, view that we have, the first real clear one that we have, that these beasts are not in chronicle, chronological order as in time, you know, one taking out the next and each kingdom following the next one. This is actually talking about four kingdoms alive on the world at the same time. And we're going to see that because it becomes very clear as we go. So it says here that this fourth beast is dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It has huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, and trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the beasts that were in its presence, is really the interpretation there. And it had ten horns, or ten kingdoms. So this is a, a fourth kingdom in the world that's made up of many other kingdoms. That are, it's a conglomeration of ten, ten kingdoms. But I would suggest, as we're going to see in other prophecies, just because it mentions that it has ten kingdoms, it doesn't mean that it's limited to ten kingdoms, but it's ten kingdoms that have dominance within the area or the geographical fix of that kingdom. There are ten powerful kingdoms, just as in the eagle and the lion are not the only two kingdoms that are involved. There are other kingdoms but they are the main kingdoms uh, in that power. And we see that as we move forward in prophecy. It's, it's quite clear that's how we need to interpret that. So this, if we now, if we're believing that this is at the time of the end, then if we're trying to make application, if we have an eagle, we see an eagle out there, we see a lion out there, we see a bear out there as good possibilities for uh, who these beasts could represent. And then we see a leopard that gets dominion over the world, which would have to be China if the, um, lion, or if the eagle goes down. Then we see a fourth beast that's made up of many kingdoms. Um, the only block of kingdoms that could be, well, actually, there's two possibilities here. Uh, I would lean uh, one way with it, though, for many reasons. Uh, the only reasonable conclusion I think one could make is that this would have to be the European Union. And we're going to see why as we move forward. Do we have any questions or comments uh, up until this point? Is the, um, the leopard uh, referred to um, or the Germany in Scripture as as well it people have said that um, it's it doesn't it doesn't quite fit uh, I mean it fits in some places but as far as scripture goes it doesn't fit can we actually see that Germany would have global dominance would be the number one superpower in the world that's, that's really the, the biggest problem that I have with that. And Germany is part of the European Union. Now, it's a, it's a powerful player in the European Union and it has a lot of influence. But if the fourth beast is the European Union, which Germany is a part of, then it wouldn't really be reasonable 
to conclude that the leopard would be Germany. And I, and I have heard that before. So you, you're not the only one that has brought that up. However, when we really start to nail down the other prophecies, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't work. It doesn't work that well. So I would, say, uh, I would say at this point, and if you've got some information that you can share with me, I would be more than willing to look at, look at that um, as well. Okay. okay, the leopard, leopard, leopard uh, dominion, uh, when and how long? <laughs> when can it be start? <laughs> when yeah. can it be started? Well, we know for sure that it's going to happen after the eagle goes down. And we, we have to wait to Daniel 8, uh, and we see another power that goes down, that's broken off of a beast, a goat. And it's called a notable horn. So we see a progression and we see more details on what actually takes out the eagle. It's war. And so we have to have a war. So you ask, you want to know the time. Well, I can't give you a, a time as in an hour, uh, a week, and a month, and a year. But I can give you events. It's going to happen after a war that takes down the United States. So until that happens, the leper isn't going to rise and the bear is not going to do its nasty, dirty work until the eagle goes down and the, the leopard will rise to the occasion once the eagle goes down. So that's, that's all I can tell you there. And I think what you're asking me is how safe is Korea? Is that what you're asking me? No, I'm talking about how long <laughs> is it going to be before the uh, daily? Oh, okay. Until the daily or uh, when? Right, right. Okay, so you're, you're getting way ahead of us. But it's going mm -hmm. to be, uh, it's not going to be uh, real soon. We have to have a war uh, where the eagle's wings are going to be plucked off and then It'll almost be immediately, immediately after the eagle's wings are plucked off, uh, the leopard will rise and have dominion, have world dominion at that point. Okay. Then how long can it go? How long do they Until the daily or after the daily or what? Well, it will probably have, it will probably be the number one power as far as the superpower is concerned. Because it doesn't seem like it's going to lose its superpower uh, ability. However, it will come under the control of this next beast. And uh, we're going to see that here as we Would go. Would the little horn have something to do with that yes. at the time? Exactly. And we're going to see that. We're not going to see it necessarily here, but we're going to see it in the interpretation and the, and the speed that we're going. I hope I'm not going too slow for you guys, but um, the speed that we're going, we're going to get to the interpretation uh, next week. So all we've been able to cover is the vision at this point. But I think it's, I think it's good. I think it's um, productive if we go through this very carefully uh, because we, we need to. We need to see exactly what it says here. So now my next question is, what is it breaking in pieces and trampling the residue? What is that? It had huge iron teeth. It was devouring, breaking in pieces, trampling the residue with its feet. It was different from all the other beasts that were before it. It had ten horns or ten kingdoms. So let's see what else it's doing here. I was considering the horns... And there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them before whom three of the first horns were plucked out by the roots. And there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man and a, sp a mouth speaking pompous words or great things. Ah, this is kind of interesting here. So... It was devouring and breaking in pieces. I wonder if that has anything to do with these uh, three horns that are plucked up. Could that have something to do with that? 
I think, I think it would naturally have something to do with that. So this little horn that comes up has something to do with plucking up three of the horns that were inside this kingdom. It's not talking about the lion. It's not talking about the bear. And it's not talking about the leopard. Those are not the three horns. Those are, those are separate individual beasts, not part of this fourth beast. So what I'm suggesting is, is that within this kingdom that's made up of ten plus others, little guys that don't have much power, this little horn comes up and it starts raising havoc, creating havoc within its own kingdom. And it takes out three. It's, and he's talking about great things. And, and as we move forward, we're going to talk about things that it's doing. What are these great things? Well, it's blasphemy. It's making war against God's people. So that's what it's devouring. It's devouring God's people within itself. And we're going to see that as we go. And so it creates a system of worship, actually. It creates a counterfeit system of worship that goes against God's true people. That's what it says. So as we unpack this prophecy, we're going to see that uh, as we go. So this is not talking about this beast somehow taking out the beast that was before it, the leopard. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about a grand persecution that happens within the kingdom itself. Not out there in the world. Although it's going to grow into the world. Daniel 7 now, verse 9, says, I watched uh, till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. Okay, I watched. Okay, this happens. While he's watching on the stage, he's seeing a lion, a bear, a leopard, and this dreadful beast, all operating... At the time of the end, and he watches, it says, I watched till thrones were put in place. And the Ancient of Days was seated. His garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. What's going on here? So at the same time, we have all those beasts on the stage. The little horn's doing its thing. We have something else happen in the heavens. We can't miss this point. Why is this thrown in right here? Because this pinpoints the time of judgment. When persecution begins in Europe, judgment will begin at some point during that time. We're going to see that. It says, a, firing, a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. A thousand thousands ministered to him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. This is in a heavenly court. This is a heavenly scene where judgment begins in heaven. That's what it's talking about here. And the judgment begins when the little horn is speaking. That's what the prophecy says. That's not what I say. That's what the prophecy says. Don't lose that point here because we want to have a look at something. I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking. I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. We're going to see here there's, there is a little bit of confusion on who this beast. Which beast is this? Well, this is the beast that contains the little horn. Is this the whole beast? that contains the little horn? Or is it the little horn itself that is destroyed? Is it the little horn, uh, this, 
this power that makes up the little horn? I believe that it is. And once we get to the book of Revelation, we can see clearly that it is this uh, power, this individual little horn power that's bodies destroyed and given to the burning flame. If you want to just jot down in your Bibles uh, right here, uh, Revelation chapter 17, uh, this little horn power is actually the harlot of Revelation 17, and she is destroyed by the ten kings, uh, and they destroy her, it says, by fire. So we can see here as we move forward, as we look at other prophecies, without the other prophecies, we can't see exactly what's going on here. So we have ten kingdoms that ultimately destroy this little horn uh, with fire. You tell us Revelation 17, 16. You tell me mark it in your Bible. Revelation 17, verse 16 and 17, we can see that uh, uh, who actually destroys this. It's the kings of the earth, the ten kings of the earth. As for the rest of the beasts... They had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. So at the time that the little horn is slain and burned, the other beasts are the ones that do it, but they lose their kingdom somehow at that point. We don't know what it is that they lose their kingdom. So this now double down, doubles down on what I said earlier. The rest of the beasts are still alive, according to what it says, when the little horn is destroyed. So the lion is alive, the, the bear is alive, the leopard is alive, and the fourth beast. They're all alive at the same time. This is what the prophecy says. They're allowed to live. They lose their dominions the kingdoms they ruled over, because there's going to be one that comes on the scene after that, the counterfeit second coming, and they will give their dominion into his hand, and we don't see that until we get to the book of Revelation, but that's a little preview as to why they lose their dominion. So the prophecy itself does not say that these are successive kingdoms, each following one another. They're all on the world stage at the same time. And these are the most powerful uh, trading blocks in the world. You've got the United States represented. You've got the UK represented. You've got Russia represented. You've got the EU represented and China represented, just as we would suspect that God is bringing to light the most powerful nations in the world uh, at that time. Why do I keep making the comment about success of kingdoms? Because the historical application, which most people would were taught, it doesn't matter what church you belong to, whether it's an evangelical church, uh, the church that I belong to, the church that I came out of, moved forward from in their understanding of the word, uh, I was taught that Babylon was the lion, Medo-Persian was the bear, uh, Greece was the leopard, and uh, where they get to the fourth beast, that's where there's a division in our understanding. Some, uh, would, they would all agree that Rome had something to do with it, but the division of the Roman Empire in the Ten Kingdoms, that's where a lot of people uh, make a separation um, most people are seeing that has something to do with the time of the end. Uh, but the, the idea being, we have to look at these prophecies objectively and see what it says and go with what it says, not what we've been taught that it says, that it actually doesn't say. Because they try to conflate Daniel's first vision in Daniel 7 with Nebuchadnezzar's dream in Daniel 2 as if they're one and the same. And that's where the problem lies. That's where the problem lies, is the connection between, between uh, what Nebuchadnezzar saw and what Daniel saw. Context is different, completely different. Daniel's prophecies were for the time of the end. Nebuchadnezzar uh, got his wake-up call that his kingdom wouldn't last forever. And that's, that's the context of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. But because of the similarities between Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, 
uh, people have joined them together. But when we look at them carefully, we can see that, hey, wait a minute, uh, we can't just do that uh, for no reason at all. Okay, so we move on here. I was watching in the night vision, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. So this now is what happens after judgment. Very interesting. We see uh, the fourth beast. Judgment happens during this time that the fourth beast is doing its nasty work of persecution of God's people. That's when God said, that's enough, and he has judgment. And then following the judgment, Yeshua, it says, comes before the Ancient of Days. And then it says, then to him was given a dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his, his kingdom, which uh, is one which shall not be destroyed. So, after the judgment, the kingdom is given to Yeshua. I propose that this judgment has a lot to do with Yeshua receiving the kingdom. It's the outcome of the judgment, is Yeshua gets the kingdom. He doesn't have the kingdom prior to judgment. He receives it after judgment. So judgment has more to do with Yeshua than it does anything else. And uh, his people will, will reap the benefits of him receiving the kingdom because then they will inherit the kingdom uh, that Yeshua receives. So let's leave it there. We're going to jump into Daniel's uh, interpretation, the interpretation that he got from Gabriel. Yes, Gabriel. And we're going to prove that to you next week, that he got his interpretation from Gabriel. And Gabriel is the angel of prophecy. He's the angel of prophecy of the first coming. We know that. And he's also the angel of prophecy regarding the second coming of Yeshua. So he he has a, a, pr a place of, of importance when it comes to first and second coming prophecies, and that's what we're seeing here. So let's stop there. Father, we thank you again for your word, and we ask that you would continue to lead us and guide us. And Father, we, we need the understanding that you can give us. We want to be true to your word, and we need to understand these things. They were important to have them written down over 2,500 years ago for us living in the time of the end. Father, we recognize that. We ask that you give us the understanding that we need. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen.